Now the purpose of this short film and demonstration is to help students who have booked on a residential painting holiday course and been disappointed that it's been cancelled or postponed during the coronavirus lockdown. I also hope it'll help students renew their enthusiasm even though they've had some experience. I'll go through the way that I paint and then um, do a short demonstration of a subject I've done before both on plain air and uh, in the studio. Now before we start I'll just go through my palette. I think all students are interested to see how their tutor um, paints and what colours they use. But you must remember that whatever tutor you're with um, we're all benign bigots. We all have an opinion about what we like and uh, the way to paint it. And it's important that you also develop your own opinions about painting. But also, as you learn and get more experience, be prepared to change your opinions in the light of what you learn. Here are the colours I am currently using. Essentially, I have examples of the um, three primaries, the blues, the reds and the yellows. And this is something, if you are not very experienced, is worth getting used to and getting accustomed to your palette. Here are the four blues and they're arranged so that they get lighter as you go from this end to that end. In the same way that the reds go from a brown to a bright red and the yellows go from a dull yellow to a, well in fact what is a, a dirty lemon. This is Windsor Blue Green, French Ultramarine, Cobalt Blue, Cerulean Blue, Burnt Umber, Burnt Sienna, Light Red, Cadmium Red, and now the yellows, Raw Umber, Raw Sienna, Oriolan Yellow and Cadmium Lemon. I've got one or two odds and ends in here. Currently they are Alizarin Crimson, Viridian Green, Cobalt Violet, Payne's Grey and there's a little bit of Cadmium Orange there. One of the things you'll find that students um, make underestimate is the size of the brush. Tutors are always asking students to bring a large brush. And when they talk about a large brush, we're talking about something like this, um, or these Chinese type brushes, which have got slightly longer hair. This type of thing, which is a size 10, and there's no uniformity uh, in terms of the measuring system, that is not what I would regard as a large brush, as sort of medium, and really a very little use uh, and uh, in doing large areas of skies and foreground. Now I've quickly sketched out a, uh, a drawing of the lockkeeper's cottage at Haybridge Basin, a scene I know well and have been painting since I was sort of about 10 or 11 and I've it's one of my favourite subjects and I've painted it several times on plain air um, and therefore uh, know roughly what the colours are. The curious thing about painting um, is that the more the longer you paint, particularly uh, repeating subjects, the more liberties um, the feel that you can take with it. Right. Well, let's start with the sky. Um, so a little bit of raw sienna and light red. And incidentally, I should say that when you're painting, try and avoid doing too much of this. You know, paint, pull the brush away from the uh, brush end. Paint. Don't sort of keep dabbing or spotting like that. Paint with the belly of the brush. Press the brush onto the paper. And if you've got rough paper, and this is a piece of Arsh 140 pound rough, then you'll need to press the brush into the paper simply to get the paint off the brush onto the paper. So this is very very dilute, light red and raw sienna touch of cobalt. That's far too much. More light red. And start here. Let's make that a little bit warmer. So go back and make another mixture. Tiny bit of cobalt.
have a little bit of blue because we want the sun sort of to be shining. So this is pretty well pure cobalt. Stir it up well so that you don't have any undiluted pigment forming little sort of holes in it. That's a little bit on the central side, a little bit of fainter as we come down towards the horizon. Um, some cerulean and alizarin crimson. A little bit of burnt umber with that as well. Far too much as usual, a bit heavy handed. Let's see, that's, that's far too much. Go back. A little bit of a little bit just to get the underneath of the clouds and then light red for the Go, go over the trees, but round the buildings if you can. The fewer... The less overpainting you do, the better. Just a little bit of dark blue underneath that. That cloud shape there. Get a nice variety of... Of shapes and colours and then as we get down towards the horizon the clouds will get a little bit smaller and the buildings we can go over these masts right over this keep it all going at the same time and then in some some darks underneath these small cloud shapes to get a little bit of cloud recession in the sky and I'm carefully painting around some shapes where I want to uh, save the white. Um, and I'll just take up some of this excess moisture. Just dry brush those hard edges. And then stop. Just be careful at this stage that you don't sort of go back. So here's me going back. That you don't go back and sort of re, uh, retouch it. Better just to leave it and let it do its own thing. If you watch it dry, it'll dry at different rates and consequently you'll start to worry. Um, the reason it dries at different rates is there's some areas of more moisture than others. Um, so the best thing to do actually once you've cleaned your palette is simply to get on and uh, do something else. So let's um, do something sort of smallish, little, little bit Yacht, a little um, dinghy here, cobalt. The right hand side is in shade, so there's ultramarine. Bit of an orangey red, light red with the cobalt will give me a, a grey, which will mix nicely with that, um, that blue to give me a fuzzy edge. It's just a uh, 
and then some light red for the bottom of the boat here. And a bit of burnt umber and burnt sienna for the side that's in the shade there. Just take a little bit off there just to indicate that that's where the light is. That fuzzes up, that doesn't matter. While we're doing that though, let's make sure that we do the cast shadow at the same time so it all joins on and it anchors the boat uh, to the ground. Right, now that the sky is dry, we can set about doing the slate roof of the uh, lock keeper's cottage. Make sure that you've got a nice generous amount of moist paint. If you've got dried up paint then the um, picture will look sort of dried up and mean. Also try and paint standing up if you can. I try when I'm painting in the studio to replicate the position that I would take if I was painting outside which is standing up. Um, it'll give you a, a certain sort of immediacy and hold the brush at the end rather than right down the uh, near here to the because that way you'll get a more painterly look um, you're not writing a letter, letter home you're painting and the two are quite different so you try and avoid sitting at a desk or a table because it's too high a little bit of light there it's a little bit of lead flashing near the base of this chimney stack. There's another one at the back there. Just dab that before it starts to misbehave. Then we can go straight on and do the shadow under the eaves. Cobalt blue and it's here. Now I like to introduce lots of different colours in these sort of shadows. A little bit, let's have a little bit of raw sienna which is going to turn a little bit greeny with that blue. It's back to the cobalt. That little angle will indi straight away indicates the angle of the sun. Strain it up a bit. A little bit of alizarin perhaps on that. Very strong colour alizarin. Then when we get to the corner we can do under the soffits ultramarine and burnt umber will give you a nice rich dark here. And then carry on. We don't want any too too much in the way of hard edges <clears throat> in the um, shadowy areas because it draws attention to the shadowy area, and people look at the light. And if you draw, draw their attention to a shadow, they know they're aware it's the wrong area. It's an unnatural place to look, and therefore it makes the, the, looking at the picture it makes them feel slightly uneasy. A little dark there, sort of a lead roof. Let's have a little bit of alizarin. Oh, sorry, cerulean. Yeah, and a bit of raw umber, perhaps. And even though I haven't actually done the grass here, I would continue with the light red ultramarine with the um, cast shadow of the building across here. Probably cut that little bit of boat there. And then while that's drying, 
let's get some real thick paint ultramarine and burnt umber almost the consistency of toothpaste and if we put it <clears throat> even against these damp areas here it sort of sucks in the excess moisture a little dark in there and uh, We can then fuzz in the, the windows while it's still a little bit wet. No, just darken that a bit. We can go back while it's still wet without losing too much of the freshness. And uh, do the dark side of this chimney while well, it's not quite dry yet. If we go back with real thick paint, and that of course cast a shadow across the this roof here. And perhaps we can even just while it's we think about it, put in the two the two chimney pots. There's one there as well. And carry on a little bit of alizarin with this grey here it's a little bit of raw umber and to make this roof as interesting as possible a bit of ultramarine now Tiny bit of alizarin with that, perhaps even a little bit of cobalt violet just to change the colour. That roof. And I uh, can't resist it, but just while that's all drying, we could just put in a little bit of cadmium red on this life belt. A little bit of red. Always helps. A bit of raw sienna. These bits of wood things stacked up there. Try and think of making a nice painterly looking mark that will look like something rather than concentrating too much on making it uh, into a plank of wood. It wants to read as a nice, what I would call, interesting watercolour mark. Right, let's just stop and uh, have wait for that to dry. Now you'll notice that, just while I'm waiting for it to dry, I always clean my palette. I think you should keep operating with as clean a palette as possible. It's the best way to um, keep your colours nice and clean and fresh. Right, let's do a little bit from the, the background, burnt, burnt umber and cobalt. To give me the sunny side of this Thames barge, let's make it a little bit darker. If it's not right when you put it on, and it's very difficult to judge what, it, what it's going to look like until you've actually got it on the paper against the next the tones that you've already delivered. Um, if it's not right, change it straight away. Don't wait and think, well I can go back and overpaint that. Um, that's not a sensible idea. I'll dot about a bit here. There's a nice blue boat here, or yacht. And uh, there's the little portholes just on the side here. And the wooden cabin top. Just suggest that keep, keep the viewer entertained and they can work out what else you've actually got on your is in your in your picture 
um, do enough for them to identify and make up the rest. Not so little that they just get fed up and are mystified, but not too much that you overstate the story. Um, and the beauty of suggesting is that whatever the, the viewer comes up with, every individual who looks at the picture, regardless of how they finish it off in their minds, is correct. Um, now while we're, while we're waiting, let's see if we can do some of these little figures. Um, should, could have done these a lot earlier really, because in reality if I'd have been on the, uh, on the, um, on the scene, these people would have been the first to have moved. Uh, and therefore they're often the things that you'd want to do. To have that one in blue, this chap will have in white, I think. So we just give him blue trousers. Try and paint them in the same spirit as the rest of the picture, so that they don't, you don't get tight. Just because they're human beings. Um, there's a large something here, I don't know what it is, but it's just a big box or something. Um, these are boats in the distance. In the, uh, in the actual um, lock basin. Now while that's dry, we can quickly put in some of this the path. Lots of different colours. It's a sort of a gravelly path. Surprising how light these paths are actually when they've got the sun on them. Just a bit more pure raw sienna. Paint round him. A bit of burnt umber with it. If we draw the <coughs> brush in the direction of the perspective, it'll help drive the viewer's attention <coughs> into the into the picture. And the rough dry brush marks as they're called indicate a little bit of the texture of the of the path. And while that's drying, ultramarine and light red will give me a sort of bluey grey for the distant shapes here. And there. Just paint round some of the whites that you want to preserve. Now we've got some large trees here. Um, Origin, of Oriolan. Keep the brush on its side and we'll be able to get an indication of the, the foliage of these spring trees. A little bit darker and more solid as we come down here. And then forget the trees and think, right, I'm now painting the shape of that boat. There's a bit of a cabin top there. And that'll all join up there. Very easy to overdo the background while you're doing it. 
you need to bear in mind all of the time this is background to foreground and therefore in painting it don't draw too much attention to it it needs to still look like the background when you finish the foreground if you see what I mean right we'll just let that dry off for a few moments and then we'll finish off round here right let's put in the the grass on this in this foreground bit of viridian and plenty of raw sienna we'll give me an, and a little bit of oriolan Give me a nice sort of sunny green. Starting here and work from the back to the foreground. Don't finish one side and then do the other side. Keep them all going at the same time. Make it a little bit richer as we come down raw sienna a lot more raw, <coughs> lot more raw sienna now. warm it up a bit even a little bit of raw umber it's very warm in here today so it's drying very quickly and there's bits of grass on this on the edge here drying. We'll um, do a little bit more to the background. The darker side of the this Thames barge, ultramarine and burnt umber. And of course now I'm painting the shoulder of that man there, so that pulls him out a bit. Whenever you're painting anything, in a sense you're painting more than one thing. You're not only painting the positive shape, but you're forcing out the neighbouring shapes as well. I just invent a little bit of a diagonal shadow there. That'll help sort of give some sense of perspective there. And uh, just a little line of the gunnel of that boat there and there now a bit of cerulean blue on that chap's leg and on the other leg it'll be ultramarine as it's going to be more in a shade same with this chappy Well, it's not quite dry that, so I don't want that to bleed too much. So just dab it. Don't keep mucking about with it, otherwise you'll you'll regret it. Put a bit of shade on the left, on the sort of right hand side of this chap. These trousers can join. be enough for, for him I think. Perhaps a slight dark just here and on that side of his face. But don't put any features um, because they then become portraits. Um, don't 
tiny bit of orange. Don't know what it is. But it just uh, helps suggest something going on in the distance. Um, a little bit of red, sort of anti-fouling on a boat here. There. Right, now if that's dry, we can set about these trees. <clears throat> oh, I need to, just before I do that, there's a little bit of red just on the corners of this, the hip roof of this, of the cottage here. <clears throat> right, now the trees in the distance, ultramarine and raw sienna. Be a darker green now. That dark does a lot to force out the sunny edge of the gable end of the cottage. Um, Viridian and burnt sienna will give me a richer dark green. Probably a little bit too much. Too much of uh, Viridian and that, put a bit more red with it. <clears throat> so we've got some big trees here. So try and do them with a little bit of a lively brush to get the feeling of of the bushes and the leaves. A bit lighter there, <clears throat> then dark again, Viridian and burnt sienna. Bit of raw sienna with it now. A little bit of aureolan. Raw sienna. <coughs> Just a bit lighter there. Back to a darker green. Same mixture of Viridian and burnt sienna and a bit thicker of course. Um, just indicate one or two branches, but don't overdo the branches. And there'll always be the odd branch where it's catching the light, so you can scratch those out with your fingernail. But again, don't overdo the tricks. Um, now that, those trees will cast a shadow, sort of a dappled shadow across the roof of this. garage shed place here. Um, just want a good dark in here. And then cobalt and light red. It'll make a nice sort of dappled shadow or those trees a shadow underneath the 
the gutter there, sort of dappled shadow there, and shadow there, there, and also only draw detail in the light. So there's the weatherboarding. be more obvious in the light and then this will be in the shade a bit darker let's just join that up there and that'll cast a shadow that'll cast a shadow of course across here mainly blue it's going to be a bush there while <clears throat> while that's still wet let's put in a thicker darker green here notice that if the paint is thick even though it's going against a moist area it pretty well stays where it is and that gives me a nice soft edge um, a bit of raw umber here um, and then some thicker paint ultramarine burnt umber to give me the sort of gutter line along here and there's a window here And a doorway here. Put that in while it's still moist rather than wet. It'll fuse and stay where it's more or less where you've put it but it'll make friends with the under painting so it'll look as if it belongs to the um, to the doorway. I might have misjudged that. Then we can just scratch out a little bit of light in that that area there and then and notice this is all about getting one edge to flow into another that's drying out a bit there so I want that to, to fuse into that ultramarine with a bit of light red and this these big trees will cast sort of shadow across here so I don't want any hard edges amongst that lot so that we look here the sharp edge against some of the darkest darks and the lightest lights now while that's drying we can go back and just give the palette a quick mop up with a sponge We should be able to go back and do some of the these big sort of posts here. They're quite dark actually. Um, there's another one here. They're to do with the lock gates. There's big lock gates here. It's a bit of Payne's grey because it's quite dark. And of course those cast a shadow so we'll put that in at the same time um, and uh, let's just put a little bit more detail here it's Masts, try, 
try and do them fairly carefully and straight. If things are meant to be straight, and I think you should paint them straight, but don't look as if you've made hard work of it, and you're, it doesn't want to look as if you've, you're worried about making a mistake. Um, and if you do, don't keep correcting it. it. Just draws even more attention to an area that you don't want the, the viewer to look at. This is the sort of sprit, the sprit, or the sail on the Thames sprit, uh, sprit sail barge here. Um, there's a crane here. Quite a nice little sort of feature, just a dark. Um, Won't be the first time that I've sort of changed the the direction of the crane, the way it's leaning. You know, if, if it, you know, if had it, you don't want them all necessarily leaning out of the picture. So it's nice to have them leaning in into the picture. Um, and there's also a telegraph pole in front of it. And there's another telegraph pole here. That will cast a shadow, of course. I should actually put put a sh his, his shadow in while I think about it. These. Um, a little bit of rigging on the barge. Don't overdo the rigging, though. Um, There's other boats here, this sail, this mast here. Again, some rigging. A huge forest of masts from various craft. Try and do them and avoid landing on top of somebody's head if you can. Um, it's a bit clumsy. So is that. Don't panic if that happens. Just take a bit of water and rub it out and go back. As I say, what I'm aiming to get a nice sort of lively look as if, despite the conditions this has been painted for my pleasure. And if somebody else gets some pleasure from it, um, that's good. It's not guaranteed. They're not academic. Watercolours don't tend to be academic um, in the sense of being academically perfectly right. Um, what they are is they've got more life and guts in them. Um, now we're getting towards the end. One or two final little adjustments. Um, this um, this barge that could be a bit darker, I think. So now's the time to just overpaint little areas. But I 
I avoid planning on to doing any overpainting because I know I'm going to make mistakes anyway. Um, which are going to require it. But if I build in overpainting, then I'm still going to make mistakes. So I'm very quickly into three, four, five layers, and that way you lose the sort of freshness and the beauty of the, uh, the watercolour wash. We want a little uh, sort of burgee on, the, on there. Smudge the end so it looks as if it's waving in the, the wind, and a few little wires. Um, from these telegraph poles I think we'll call that a day uh, once you feel that whatever you do isn't necessarily going to strengthen the picture but weaken it um, then probably it's time to to stop um, don't keep looking around for things to add look at the subject and ask yourself have you got the main things forms shapes tones and colors that drew you to the subject in the first place and then look at your picture and ask yourself is there anything really significant that um, I've forgotten to put in and more to the point is there anything that you've overdone and in a sense overstated and you draw it draws the viewers attention to something in the picture the way you've done it where in fact they wouldn't have made uh, they wouldn't have seen it in the the subject it's not what you've looked at it's the way you've painted it that uh, will attract people's attention. Well, I hope you enjoyed that uh, video of watching me uh, paint. Um, I think the most important thing during this uh, lockdown period is to use it profitably, get to know your palette and colours, and uh, gain confidence in painting, irrespective of whether you've painted much before or not. And then when the lockdown finishes and we are all able to venture outside again and perhaps even go on courses and we'll be able to take full advantage of that opportunity. Good luck, thanks for watching and keep safe.